Hi, everybody. Thank you guys so much for joining early. Um, we're going to get started in about five to 10 minutes. Just give everyone a chance um, who might be logging on a little bit late. If you have questions, please just put them into the chat. Um, you're all auto muted um, and your videos won't show. So um, if you do have questions, please just put them in the chat.
Okay, hello everybody. Um, we're gonna get started to get started now. So just a few technical notes before we get into it. Um, as I mentioned, um, everyone is auto muted when you sign on, so you don't need to worry about that. Same with your video. Um, and if you are having any, having any issues um, with hearing us or um, any, any other troubleshooting things, just please message in the chat um, and we will do our best to help you out. You can also phone in, which might um, help the issue if, if you're not able to hear us on your computer. Um, and if you do have any questions, please just put them in the chat and we will do our best to answer uh, all of your questions at the end. And we'll also leave you with our contact information and, and you can always reach out to us at, at any point. So we'll just get started then. So thank you again for joining, um, especially during um, these times. Um, today we'll be talking about uh, traveling litter with Nova Scotia's Adopt a Highway, who we are very fortunate to have with us here today. Um, a quick intro of myself. So I am Emily Anderson. I'm the assistant manager for the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. And I've been with the program now for about eight months. Um, and I'm located in Toronto, Ontario, although we are a uh, national program. Uh, my name is Amy Langell. I am the manager for the Nova Scotia Adopt a Highway program. I have been with the program for almost three, year and a, three years now, and I am located in Toronto, Nova Scotia. <clears throat> so we'll just run through the agenda quickly. Um, so we'll do a quick introduction of each of our programs in case this is your first time with us today. Um, and then we will talk about um, what we found in 2019, which is actually a sneak peek um, because we haven't actually released our annual report yet. Um, and then we will chat a little bit about um, unusual items. We're also going to discuss where the items came from, where the litter comes from, the impact it has on wildlife, and what you can do from the comfort of your home right now during this pandemic. So a little bit about the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. Um, we are, uh, we started in 1994, so about 26 years ago now, and it was started by a few employees and volunteers um, at the Vancouver Aquarium who thought that they, um, that Stanley Park, the area uh, right around the Vancouver needed to be cleaned up. They were finding lots of litter on the ground and they wanted to make a difference in their community. Fast forward to now, and we're one of the largest direct action conservation programs in Canada, um, and we're a partnership between both OceanWise and the World Wildlife Fund Canada. And overall, our mission is to inspire Canadians to keep our shorelines um, free of litter. And shorelines for us is anywhere um, that land connects to water, so that could be your uh, community park, it could be a beach, um, a storm drain, uh, literally anywhere. Um, in 2019, so up until now, we've completed, or our volunteers actually, have completed over 27,000 cleanups across 44,000 kilometers of shoreline in Canada. And over that time, they've uh, collected and removed over 2 million uh, kilograms of litter, which is really impressive. And uh, this year, we were hoping to reach our 1 millionth citizen scientist. You never know, we might uh, still reach that once this is all over and people are able to get outside, but either way, we have a lot of really passionate and wonderful volunteers in our program who have really made a difference um, in their community across the country. So to provide a brief history on our program, we, the Nova Scotia Adopt a Highway program, provide volunteers the opportunity to contribute to our local communities and province by removing litter from roadsides and interchanges, which are also known as exit ramps. In 1992, the Women's Institute of Nova Scotia, the Lions Club of Nova Scotia, Clean Nova Scotia, and the Department of Transportation initiated this program as a pilot project. And by 1997, with the help of um, HRM, or the Halifax Regional Municipality, uh, we were able to officially launch. In 2019, we took over the delivery of the Great Nova Scotia Pick Me Up program as well. This program also started in 92 by Clean Nova Scotia. And uh, the program, this program is Nova Scotia's largest volunteer-driven litter cleanup program. 
We now run both programs and we are able to broaden our reach and remove even more litter from the province than ever before because we're no longer limited to roadsides. Through both of our programs, we can encourage volunteers to organize and take part in litter cleanup. And uh, we host cleanup registration, provide supplies, safety information, and garbage removal advice to participants. And uh, in 2019, we had a really great year. We had 550 cleanups and over 14,000 volunteers in the province of Nova Scotia alone. So we're really happy with that. And so I'm just going to, as I said, do a quick uh, sneak peek of our litter data that we've collected in 2019. Um, as I said, our annual report hasn't been released yet, and so I'm not able to share um, our uh, Canada-wide data, but I've collected our top 12 items, so our dirty dozen for the Atlantic provinces. Um, so these are the 12 most commonly found items on our shorelines uh, collected by our volunteers. Um, so as you can see, and I'll, I'll just kind of go through, go back and forth between this slide and the next slide. Um, so you can see quickly here. So I highlighted the three items that are um, common and, and the highest among both of them. So that's cigarette butts, um, tiny plastics and pieces of foam and uh, rope, which is surprising compared to um, the typical uh, Canada wide list. So, what these items have in common and what these lists have in common is that, um, and probably not surprising to you, the majority of these items are single use plastics and anything that is considered a single use plastic, I've highlighted um, for you on the list to make it easier uh, at a quick glance to see what those might be. And so these are items that, most items that we might be able to find alternatives to, um, and I'm sure you've seen many of these items on your shorelines with um, and what is uh, also, I guess, um, similar among these items is that science tells us that the majority of these items uh, originated on land, except for uh, maybe the fishing gear uh, and potentially the rope, as those uh, probably came in through the fishing industry. Um, also of interest is um, the findings from PEI, and these are most interesting to me because uh, there, this list is least similar uh, to the others, as well as past Canada-wide lists. And this is uh, useful information for us, but as well as other researchers, uh, groups, government officials, uh, municipalities. The list goes on because when imp implementing policy, um, data such as this tells us um, where certain policies should be implemented and what those policies should be about. So. Um, we might see that in Prince Edward Island, it might not be as efficient to ban a certain item uh, as in the other Atlantic provinces. And I'm curious to see um, if this is what you expected to see on these lists. Um, and if it is, um, please let us know in the chat. And if it's not, um, we'd love to hear what you're seeing on your shorelines as well. So the adoption highly data is similar. Uh, to what Emily has discussed. Our most commonly reported items were takeout coffee cups, cigarette butts in the packaging, uh, assorted plastics, and we break those down um, in terms of single-use bags, plastic pieces, that kind of thing. Also, takeout containers and packaging for food, and cans and bottles. But again, what these all have in common is they're single-use items, and those are what we're finding littered throughout the province. We divide our litter into different categories. As you can see in the graphic, uh, this represents our waste categories. There are six of them. And what we found was litter was made up 56% 56, 56 food and beverage, which includes bottles, cans, bottle caps, straws, fast food containers, 13% smoking, uh, which includes cigarettes, uh, cigarette lighters, cigarette butts, uh, and related packaging. 11% ocean and waterway, which includes bait containers, buoys, and floats. 8% recreational activities, including bags, balloons, clothing, ammunition, and toys. 8% um, illegal dumping. So we 
consider that to be large appliances, building materials, and car parts. And then 4% medical and personal hygiene, which includes diapers, needles, condoms, that kind of thing. And um, we're kind of interested to see what's going to happen this year with the glove and mask. But we have had a lot of reports of those being littered, so we expect that 4% to increase this year. Um, hopefully <laughs> it doesn't, but it seems like it will. And again, it seems similar to what um, Emily is finding too. But those are the common items that we've found in 2019. Some unusual items that we found at the Adopt a Highway uh, are pretty unusual last year. So in addition to tracking the more common litter items, we also asked the most unusual litter found during a cleanup. And each year at the Adopt a Highway, we hold what we call the litter suit contest, where we award cash prizes to the three most unusual or weird items found during a cleanup. So in 2019, first place was a negative pregnancy test found by Ashley Kennedy. Second place went to the Man Union cleanup party for their find of a collection of satanic novels. And third place went to the Cape Breton Environmental Association for their collection of doll heads that they found. So some other weird items that have been found on our shorelines through the TCSC program um, in Atlantic Canada in particular include five vacuums in New Brunswick, um, 82 plastic flowers in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, and two pool air mattress floats in Nova Scotia, as well as a martini shaker and a light bulb in PEI. So lots of different things and you kind of wonder where all of these are coming from. Um, again, we would love to hear from you um, if you found some really weird or interesting items um, in your cleanups or just um, on your walk throughout your neighborhood. So where does litter come from? It's widely agreed upon in the scientific community that 80% of litter and plastic on our shorelines and in our oceans originated on land. But the question still remains as to um, how did it end up there or how far away from where it originated from did it end up? Um, and the answer to that is not uh, simple. And I think it's depending on the item and the region and many other factors. Um, but we do know that litter travels. And this is what makes it so difficult to um, find the source of um, where it came from. Um, litter can travel via wind, water, and it can even be carried from place to place um, through various species um, in the wild. So I'm going to quote something from um, the recently published draft science assessment on plastic pollution, uh, just to give you an idea of the variety of places that um, plastic and litter are being found in the environment and where they're coming from. So. Um, and I'm quoting, so plastic pollution in the aquatic environment can arise from plastics released during land-based activities, just as Amy said. And this is through littering, uh, inadequate waste management, landfill leachate, the use of plastics in agriculture, land application of biosolids, or direct release following abrasion or maintenance of plastic products um, from the deposition of airborne micro microplastics onto water or from water-based sources. So this is the other 20%, which includes um, fishing-related uh, litter mostly. And plastic pollution in water may also arise um, from the accidental release of raw plastic materials, um, such as spillage during transport and from releases from wastewater effluent. So I'll get into that a little in a little bit more depth on the next slide. But basically, um, raw plastic materials are those little pellets, um, so little uh, plastic circles, uh, pellets that are uh, used to create the plastic items that we use in our everyday life. Um, so I found this uh, figure in a paper, and I've quoted it here on the slide, and I'm more than happy to share. Um, I thought it was um, a well, well done, and it's also in the um, draft science assessment for plastic pollution. Um, but basically, uh, this figure represents estimates of plastic loading and transport pathways um, in the environment. They've taken um, aggregated information from various um, reports in the scientific literature to try and give us a better idea of where plastic is coming from and then where it's ending up. So, Again, I'm sure this is different for every single region uh, based on many different factors. Um, 
but I think this gives us a good idea of um, where a lot of it is coming from. So um, I'm just going to highlight a few of um, the arrows here because it's a little bit out of the scope, I guess, of this webinar overall. So the first one I wanted to um, chat about is the mishandled waste, which is on the right side. And it has one of the larger arrows because it's a higher percentage. So it's at 25 to 28%, which means that um, after manufacturing, um, 25 to 28% of waste um, is basically ending up in the environment. Um, so land, rivers, et cetera, which as we know, eventually do end up in the ocean as well. Um, and mishandled waste could include a few different things, um, but essentially it's likely either um, one of the two that I'm about to mention. So the first one is litter. So items that have uh, just been left behind in the environment, either purposely or not, um, or has potentially blown out of a garbage container that wasn't properly secured. And then the second uh, way that mishandled waste is ending up in the environment is um, through pre-production plastics. So as I said, the pellets, uh, the nurdles um, that are being transported on trucks to these facilities, and they're either being lost out of the trucks on their way there, or they're being lost um, on the manufacturing floor and then going through the drains and then ending up in our lakes and rivers, et cetera. And then the second um, that I wanted to highlight um, was on the left side, and that is um, also one of the larger arrow arrows which leads from manufacturing um, and use to landfill. And this is at 21 to 42%. So that means that many of the plastic products that are being manufactured and used within our society are ending up in the landfill. And we know that many plastic products um, that are being produced are uh, recyclable, except of course, many single use items. So they're not supposed to be ending up in landfill. And this is a problem for a few reasons. So, for one, it can take years, hundreds of years to break down in a landfill. It's just not the proper environment, um, even longer than it would take to break down in the natural environment. While they're in the landfill, they can release toxins and chemicals into the atmosphere, which again is, contributes to greenhouse gases. Um, if the landfill is not a higher grade, meaning um, it has the proper leachate, um, uh, skin on the bottom, then uh, the plastic items may be blown out by the wind and end up in the environment anyway. So this is a huge problem in rural and um, more northern or arctic communities. And then finally, um, by putting things in landfills that aren't supposed to be there, we're contributing to the filling and overfilling of our landfills, which are already too full. And so then we end up with this question as to where does all of our waste go at that point? Um, so I'm not going to go into depth about the other ones, but we can definitely see that a lot of um, a lot of these circles and these arrows are ending up in natural areas. So our oceans, sediments, lakes, and rivers, um, which is not good for a variety of reasons and has a huge impact on our wildlife overall. So this is a uh, map that is on our website, and it's part of a campaign that we launched last year called uh, Nature Sans Plastique, so nature without plastic. And I just took a quick screenshot of it um, and I wanted to highlight a few of the uh, species impacted by plastic pollution. Um, first, I'd like to say that these are only a few of the species. Um, we know that all organisms of all trophic levels are impacted by microplastics in the marine environment. Um, and there's actually recently been conclusive evidence that shows that there are population level impacts on plastic pollution. Um, in other words, there is a very real ecological threat uh, when we leave litter and plastics in the environment. So I'm just going to highlight a few species here that are on the map. So the piping plover, for example, um, is very sensitive to the destruction of its habitat and disturbances in its nesting areas. And many of these are found along uh, Lake Huron. And a lot of our volunteers were telling us that um, cigarette butts are very high around that area and that impacts the species. And so um, when we know this through our data, we're able to implement um, 
uh, policies or a different infrastructure to help reduce that so that these species are able to thrive in their natural environment. Uh, another species I'd like to highlight is the northern map turtle. And um, so this species of turtle is also very sensitive to disturbances in its breeding grounds. Um, but the main issue associated with plastic pollution is that they feed on mussels, which filter uh, water and accumulate toxins. Um, and so when they eat these mussels, they're also being contaminated uh, by microplastics that the mussels might have eaten. Um, beluga whales are in a, uh, a similar situation um, in that water toxins are accumulated in the beluga whales food sources and eventually these contaminants are passed down. Um, to their young through their breast milk. And then finally, this one, for me at least, um, was the most surprising when I found out that uh, moose are actually also impacted by plastic pollution. I didn't um, think about this because they're not necessarily a marine mammal, but um, they are unfortunately endangered in mainland Nova Scotia because they are actually um, skillful swimmers who dive a few meters deep to feed on plants at the bottom of lakes. Um, and due to the change in their habitat, um, they're not able to do that and they end up eating trash on land. So it's very sad, um, but those are just a few of the species that are impacted. As I said, there are many others who are unfortunately dealing with these things on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and finally, I just wanted to mention that um, there's also an issue of non-native species. So um, if a water bottle, for example, were to enter a lake, then organisms can gather on top of that. Um, and then the water bottle would float down the lake or the river and end up um, in a different area carrying along with it those organisms who um, weren't necessarily supposed to be there in the first place. I think we oh I go back to slide 13 yeah that'd be great. Thanks I, apologize. I apologize we're we're just missing a slide here um I can just go over it you yeah want. thank you <laughs> so we Sorry. wanted to also that's all right we also wanted to talk about the traveling litter bugs so those would be the litter bugs that are throwing out litter throughout their car or throughout their window in their vehicle uh, while driving down the road. We wanted to point out that um, the harmful effects of that on wildlife. So wildlife are then attracted to the roadway by the litter. So even a seemingly innocent apple thrown from a car window can attract birds and wildlife onto the roadway, resulting in wildlife most likely being injured or killed. These collisions can impact our environment in multiple ways. Like I said, with the both humans and wildlife could be injured or killed in this type of accident. And additionally, there is also the damage to the vehicle to consider, which generates needless waste or garbage um, via the vehicle repair or replacement. So there's um, definitely something to consider there. So every time a roadside cleanup is completed, it minimizes wildlife's attraction to road road rates sorry, roadways, which can ultimately reduce wildlife versus automobile collisions. So that's very uh, important to note as well. So as we monitor the advice of local, provincial, and federal health groups, we continue to advise that upcoming cleanups should be postponed until it becomes clear that everyone can participate safely. Um, but the question then becomes, um, what can we do from the comfort of our homes if, if um, we want to help reduce or eliminate the threat of litter um, and plastic pollution in our environment? Um, but before we dive into it, um, we would both just like to acknowledge that um, it may not be feasible or possible for us all to be as low waste as we may normally be, and that's okay. It's important that we're focusing on our health and well-being right now. Um, but if you are able, we thought these might be a, a few ways that you could get involved in lowering your uh, waste footprint while you're spending time at home. So the first idea we had was a do-it-yourself home waste audit. Um, which we're hoping to publish soon in the next week or so. And we'd love for you to follow us um, along on that journey. Um, but basically we want to help answer some questions that um, 
ourselves and, and many others might have um, about, you know, how does your trash can always manage to fill up so fast or what are you putting in there and is it all actually trash? Is it supposed to be going to landfill or could it have been recycled or put in the compost bin? So by completing an audit or categorizing and assessing your waste, you'll be able to find out what is actually in your trash bin and if maybe some of it could have been disposed of more sustainably. And this is what is known as diverting your trash. So all of the waste that we keep out of the landfills um, and reuse, recycle or repurpose is, is trash that has been uh, diverted from its path to the landfill. Um, and as you conduct your audit, um, you'll, find, you'll be able to find out more about yourselves and uh, what you're throwing out. And this might help you going forward um, in deciding what areas um, of your day-to-day -day lives you might be able to change or your habits or behavior that might um, encourage a more low-waste lifestyle. Um, so next, I wanted to highlight some uh, something else you could do from home is our online education resources. So um, we've compiled some fun activities for kids and adults to help them learn about the impacts of plastic pollution and other forms of litter um, and to engage in uh, keeping our oceans and freshwaters healthy. So these are available online on our website, but also uh, many others have done uh, put together some fun things for everyone to get involved in, no matter your age. Um, and I highly recommend you check them out. It's a good way to keep busy um, and to uh, learn about the natural environment um, and how we can help keep wildlife safe. And in Nova Scotia, too, we have lots of online learning opportunities for all ages. So websites from Clean Nova Scotia, Green Schools, and Divert Nova Scotia have all developed great tools to help individuals learn more about their environment. And if anybody wants those links, I'll definitely be able to pass those out afterwards. Um, something else we thought we could mention um, that maybe not everyone has thought of before is um, the fact that our homes are also releasing microplastics into various bodies of water, um, including our oceans. So uh, many of the microplastics that we're finding in our oceans are microfibers and microfibers are a type of microplastic that are released uh, when we wash synthetic clothing. So uh, these, this is clothing that's made from plastics such as polyester or acrylics. Um, and there is some evidence to suggest that these fibers detach from our clothes during the washing and then go into the wastewater. And then the wastewater goes into sewage treatment facilities. Um, and because they're so small, they pass right through uh, the filtration processes and make their way into our rivers, lakes, and oceans. Something else we thought we could point out would be um, stopping litter before it happens. Because most litter is incidental, there are a few things that even the most litter wise, little conscious person or individual can do to avoid unintentionally littering. So ensuring curbside garbage is tied tight and bags are free of rips and tears. During poor weather conditions or expected uh, weather conditions to move curbside garbage to a secure area. Keeping your curbside area tidy and litter free is a really big one. And of course, talking to others about the harmful effects of litter. So help spread the word. We would love to hear from you if you have any other questions or ideas on how to be low waste or reduce litter during these unfortunately unprecedented times. I know we do have some questions in the chat and we'll get to those in just a moment. Um, uh, so I also just wanted to mention that uh, even if you don't have other ideas of how you might reduce, but potentially um, you can have a look at um, things that you might be doing on a day-to-day -day basis um, where you would be able to reduce your waste um, or at least be lower waste going forward, um, even if it is after all of this is, is, has passed. Um, so thank you guys. Oh. No, go ahead, Emily. <laughs> thank you guys so much for joining us um, today.
Um, if you have any questions, um, please, as I said, put them in the chat um, and we can answer them that way. So afterwards, if you want to reach out to us, you can definitely do so via our email or call either of our programs. Um, to answer Renee's question over in the chat, uh, it says, do either of you know of any recycling programs that handle plastic bags? Um, that would vary depending on where you lived and um, in Nova Scotia, depending on which county you're in, uh, would change. Uh, so it just really depends on where, you're li where you live. Um. Oh, Alexis. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, Emily, I was going to say, can you um, maybe talk more about Natalie's question there? Yeah, I'm just reading. Okay. Uh, is this, uh, so Natalie says, people think recycling plastic is enough. Um, they don't realize eventually it is not usable at a certain point, and that is absolutely true. Um, most items are, are only recycled a few times before they're no longer a useful material. Um, and quite often, uh, compostable or biodegradable plastics, um, although they might be, um, many municipalities don't have the infrastructure to actually do that um, and to include them in the compost system. And so um, leaving them in the environment, they're not under the right conditions to actually uh, decompose. So you're absolutely right. Alexa made a really good point, which um, I, I should have pointed out, is that in Nova Scotia, almost all the municipalities have what goes where apps. So if you're not sure where something goes and you're sorting your garbage, you can look in the app and it will tell you what uh, bin to put it in. And they also provide reminders of when your garbage day is coming out. So they're very handy apps. Alexa uh, mentioned that the local groups stop trashing it. Um, Alexa, maybe you can confirm that that's local to Nova Scotia, um, has some great tips on waste reduction that they're sharing on social media. So definitely check that out. Mm -hmm. They're doing a really good job. Um, in response to um, Ali, it's, says, um, is it true that only BC has a real recycling facility to process recycling items? Uh, to be honest, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe you could elaborate on what you mean by a, a real recycling facility. Um, as far as I know, um, most communities, at least um, in southern Canada, are do have uh, proper recycling facilities. It's just that Perhaps not all items are able to be recycled. Um, I see your program is suspended during the pandemic. Do you have concerns about the virus being on litter? Um, I can speak on behalf of GCSC. So we're just trying to make sure that our volunteers are as safe as possible throughout this whole thing. Um, and so we definitely don't want to um, encourage anyone to be going outside unnecessarily just based on what federal, provincial, and local health authorities are telling us. Um, there's, of course, a concern that there could be um, something on the litter, but um, we don't know and, and we just don't want to encourage anyone. Uh, we don't want anyone to get hurt. Safety is absolutely our number one priority for our, vol for our volunteers. Um, but as always, definitely consult uh, your local health authorities um, above all else. No, I'd have to agree with that too. Um, very well said. Now we had a question, when will the 2019 litter item findings be released to the public? Um, for the Adopt a Highway, those will be coming out um, probably in the next month in our literature newsletter. So you can um, just email us if you wanna be on our news um, our newsletter mailing list, but uh, those will be, those will come out in about a month's time. And that's um, similar to us. Um, we're hoping that we can have our uh, annual report released um, very soon. Um, if you sign up for a newsletter um, or join us on webinars, um, we'll definitely be there as well. Um, Natalie asks, could people reach out to major polluters to stop using plastic and be begin using proper alternatives? Um, I, that's an interesting question. I think that um, 
the biggest way that we as individuals can make changes through our own um, behavior behavior so um, everything relies on demand right so if we're using alternatives um, and trying to be as low waste as possible then um, eventually um, things will change as there wouldn't be as much of a demand for um, other products exactly yeah Uh, do you have tips to organize your own community cleanup? Um, we do, of course, have resources on our website, um, but as I said, it's not something that we're, I apologize for my dog in the background, uh, we, we don't, we're, we're not encouraging um, cleanups right now just uh, because, as, as I said, safety is absolutely our number one priority. Um, but after all of this is um, over and we get the go ahead from government and health officials, um, we should absolutely connect. Um, and I'd be happy to share as I'm sure Amy is as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any other questions or anything maybe we didn't get to? Um, Kristen said that she found fake nails in the park in downtown Toronto uh, during a cleanup. And I just think that sometimes I think that I've seen it all. <laughs> but uh, definitely I still get surprised on what is found during these cleanups. So yeah. it's, uh, you just never know what you're going to find. Yeah, it definitely makes for it to be very interesting times. <laughs> How is uh, use of our materials changing during the COVID-19 outbreak? Um, let, please let me know if I'm not understanding the question properly, but um, I think there's definitely at least, you know, obviously I haven't been uh, doing cleanups, but as it is all right for us to walk our dog in my area, um, I am noticing a lot more um, health items being littered. Um, in my neighborhood at least um, so I assume that would be there's a change of materials and of course um, due to safety and health um, people are using more single-use items right now but that's okay I think that we all need to be um, understanding of other people and not so hard on ourselves um, health is definitely the number one priority mm -hmm. yeah, to Natalie's question have you ever found lost treasure um, not not uh, that I can say for sure, but I know that a lot of groups have found cash. Yeah. So that's always an exciting find for sure. I remember last, uh, during our last international coastal cleanup, which happens in September, we found uh, some cash in a pirate's mug. So that's treasure if you ask me. <laughs> and Natalie says less people picking up litter because of COVID um, it is accumulating. And yes, we are seeing more of it um, now. 80% of our adopt a highway cleanups throughout the province uh, of Nova Scotia do occur during spring. So we are seeing perhaps maybe a little bit more right now than we normally would, or we're hyper aware of it because we know we can't get out there. Um, but we have uh, extended, our, we will be extending our season into the fall as long as we can. Um, and that's us hoping that we will be able to open up this summer or this, yeah, this summer. So once we're given the okay to open our registration, uh, we will do so. But uh, like I said, we'll extend it. Usually it stops, I believe it's um, October 1st, and we're going to extend it as long as, I, like I said, into the fall as we can. So hopefully we can get more cleanups into the fall this year. Just while there's no questions happening right now, I just wanted to mention that um, we do have a webinar series happening right now. So typically every Thursday we have a webinar on different topics, but all related to ocean and freshwater health um, and uh, litter and plastics solution, of course. So uh, next week we're actually chatting with a few of our bona fide experts from our Ocean Wise Plastics Lab. Um, it's uh, more of a panel where we will be asking them questions uh, for them to answer on um, anything that you might, might be wondering about plastic pollution and how it affects um, our oceans or uh, wildlife. 
So if you're interested, please uh, sign up for that one. Um, and if you go to our website, you'll see there are other um, webinars lined up. We have about four of them listed on our website at, at a time. Those sound great. And I really want to um, thank the great Canadian Shoreline for inviting us to be a part of this today. It was great. Thank you. No, thank you. It's, it's always great to have a, a different perspective of a similar program and to learn more about a specific region. Um, and if, as, uh, as we said, both of our uh, contact information is listed on the slide here and, and please feel free to reach out at any time. Um, we are more than happy to answer your questions or to chat um, if, if you do have questions. Um, and I'll just give it a couple more minutes in case uh, there are questions in the chat. Um, and then we will be logging off. Oh, um, so for copies of the resources, um, including the draft science assessment um, and infographic, absolutely happy to share that. Um, I will uh, send you an email um, or you can send me one and, um, and I'm happy to share those with you. Yep, absolutely. So um, there's one question, um, how can we take better control and take responsibility for all the substances that we're putting into the environment and uh, what process should we implement to create uh, circular economies? So that's a big question. Um, I think um, in terms of taking better control as an individual, um, we can do things first. We have to know what we're putting into the environment. So doing something like um, the waste audit within your home so you have a better idea of what you're throwing out in the first place so that you can then look for alternatives for those items. Um, that would be on the individual level. Um, in terms of um, more higher up, I think it depends on the region. Um, in Canada, all of the provinces um, have different uh, methods for uh, waste management processes, different facilities and infrastructure um, policies and legislation around waste. And so it's hard to implement a blanket solution across um, all of Canada. I think um, it's more on an individual basis and this is really where uh, municipalities and individuals are able to really step up and um, help make a difference within their community. I'm not sure if we touched on Steve's question about uh, regulation regarding recently passed cigarette packaging or not. Um, it would be my opinion that it's too soon to tell. Um, I'm not sure what you think, Emily, but I would say that um, it would be nice to see that over a few years of cleanups, I would think, um, at least that, yeah, at least a few, just to see if there is a trend of it going down. That would be nice. Yeah. We'll definitely be looking for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to make um, decisions after, after over over like one year of data. Long long term is always always better. Um, so there's a question of where we can watch the recording. Um, so hopefully we can have those up um, on YouTube. Um, if you send me an email, I can get back to you with that information when I have a more definite answer. So Samantha and Daniela have asked about how we use our materials has changed during the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, if I understand the question correctly, I would have to answer and say that I feel like we are using more disposable items than we would have been before. So more, per, more people are using disposable gloves and they're being, unfortunately, some are being littered. Um, disposable wipes, one-time use wipes. And the, the, I don't know if they're quite disposable after one time, but the masks as well are generating more waste. But we have to do what we have to do to be safe and their health comes first. So I don't, uh, I don't want to say anything too, negatively about any of that, <laughs> just as long as it doesn't make it onto the ground for litter, I'm happy, I guess. <laughs> yeah, 
Any more questions or maybe weird items you found or uh, surprising things you might have learned in the webinar or, it, or if there's anything you wanted to learn more about, um, please just let us know. Um, always looking for topics or ideas to chat about. <clears throat> Can you follow us on Instagram? Yes, absolutely. Um, so let me just. So you can follow us at Shoreline Cleanup. Um, there we'll be posting lots of information about our webinars, things we're finding, and it'll um, help keep you up to date, I guess, on uh, what's, what's up next. Um, Amy, um, are you able to share any information you have for social media? Definitely. So the Adopt a Highway and the Great Nova Scotia Pick Me Up each have their own Facebook page, and the Great Nova Scotia Pick Me Up is on Instagram and Twitter, and the handles at NSPICNIF. I think I have a bit of a delay in the question and the answer section, so I apologize if we have missed any. Mm. Good point. I'm not seeing any more questions, um, but if you did have one that maybe uh, you just didn't want to ask in the chat or, you know, something comes up later, uh, please do reach out to one of us. Um, and again, happy to share resources. Uh, same with Amy. So um, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, it really means a lot when you log in um, and hopefully we will see you on our next webinar. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone.